Let's turn to what some famous celebrities are doing, taking an advocacy on better life for everyone across the globe. Now they're actually petitioning the G20 leaders uh, for reform on uh, debts of developing countries and also uh, climate issues challenging, particularly those in developing countries. What would this mean? What would it result to at the end of the day? And when celebrities, famous names, take up advocacy like this when they're not actually an organization that would usually do this, what does it mean for the world? We have Sam Oroji, who is uh, Director of Center for Public Policy in the studio with us this morning to look at the issue. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Blessing. My pleasure to be here. Good morning. Glad to have you join us. Good morning, Femi. Thank yeah. you. Yes, usually when celebrities come together, it's either it's for charity or for uh, advocacy, for maybe gender equality or some other things. But this time around, it's for reform on the financial, um, for financial reforms across the global stage. First, they want debt um, reforms for developing countries that are heavily challenged by uh, a huge debt burden and then secondly they want uh, reforms that would tackle the climate crisis that has been faced. Firstly, why do you think they're very concerned and are petitioning the G20 leaders is not a common thing that we find? Uh, thank you very much indeed. I think um, Stephen Fry, uh, Richard Curtis and some other uh, world celebrities, uh, particularly uh, in the fame and the comedian industry. Uh, two of those guys are from the UK. Uh, they've been able to collect over a hundred uh, signatures uh, in terms of the petition that has been written to the G12, uh, G20. Rather, sorry. Um, one of the major issues uh, in the last 20 to 25 years uh, has been a global call uh, to reform uh, the global financial system has not been working in the interest of uh, the developing countries in particular. So it's welcoming uh, that celebrities are putting this um, across to the G20 leaders that there's a need uh, to recalibrate uh, uh, debt, particularly uh, to the global south. Uh, there's a need, after 80 years of uh, the Bretton Woods institution uh, to be reformed, in a way that we have a balanced financial uh, engineering that will favor the global south and the global north. So this call is welcoming, uh, particularly even at the hill of uh, the spring meeting uh, that is taking place today uh, in Washington from today to uh, 19th on Friday. So this um, is a global call for action. Why there's a need uh, to reform the financial institution after 80 years of existence. And I subscribe to that view because uh, the Bretton Woods institutions uh, has not really been very helpful, uh, particularly to the developing countries. You know, this kind of move is quite unusual. You know, this kind of open letter to G20 petition coming from the celebrities. But now that it's coming at a crucial time like this, where the spring meeting is here, do you think it's going to influence the conversation at this meeting or the level of uh, deliberations at this meeting? Of course, it may not have any immediate impact, but uh, it will have. Even uh, the package of the uh, spring meeting, uh, there's a particular uh, 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 day uh, that is dedicated to voices uh, from the civil society. And I'm sure this will resonate um, uh, with the civil society, particularly in line uh, with the clamor by this celebrity for climate change adaptation, climate change uh, resilience, and climate change financing that uh, the global not uh, try to be pursuing, but in terms of critical action, of support, in terms of financing, uh, has not really uh, come through, particularly in the global south. So I think it will make an impact, and those um, civil society voices in the fringe of that uh, spring meeting, this will resonate with them. And I think in the long run, uh, it will make some uh, impact. And they are still collecting signatures. So far, as out of yesterday, they've collected over 100 uh, signatures. And that, uh, in my view, is a significant milestone 
uh, in terms of the call for uh, restructuring of uh, the global financial system, and which uh, we have spoken uh, about in this station in the past. All right, so this uh, move is aimed at, one of, one of the things it's aimed to achieve is to pressure uh, the Brentwood Wood institutions to restructure uh, the debt uh, uh, for debt relief for developing countries, which are usually, uh, which are in huge debts. So firstly, you mentioned that uh, some of the, the, the actions and operations of the brain CEO institutions have not helped developing countries. Could you expand on that? Okay. Uh, the way the global architecture is designed uh, after uh, the Second World War, uh, when a Marshall Plan was rolled out uh, uh, for development, but if you look at uh, the original plan vis-a-vis uh, -vis the current development, and you see the role of the World Bank and the IMF, uh, some of their policy framework have not really helped in terms of the developmental equation between the global north and the global south, which was meant uh, to achieve originally. Two, um, the global financial architecture has always been in favor of the West, particularly when you look at the unit of a transaction, particularly uh, the dollar as a mechanism uh, for the settlement of uh, international trade, which has not really all gone away for the global south. There are other things. If you look at the conditionalities of the IMF and some of the issues uh, why they advise governments, uh, particularly in Africa, to always uh, uh, devalue their currency, uh, take loans with some high level of conditionality that um, the public uh, pay for for a long period of time. When you look at it from that perspective, then there's a problem. Then two, as an institution that has existed for over 80 years, there's some mechanism of reform that must be brought to bear in terms of the way uh, that uh, institution has been structured since its existence. Those are my personal views. All right, now, in the call for debt relief, do you think that call is justifiable? Because, let's give the, the, the instance of Nigeria, some time, some years ago, when Nigeria had uh, Dr. Okunjo Iwela as finance minister, she was able, alongside her team, uh, then, then President, uh, former President uh, Obasanjo, secure debt relief for Nigeria. But if you look now, Nigeria is heavily indebted, alongside other African countries. So this call for debt relief by African leaders, supported by celebrities and even some other persons and some of the authorities across the globe, is it justifiable? Uh, to a very large extent, it's justifiable uh, because when you even look at uh, the way some of those loans are structured, are packaged, when the decisions are made, uh, uh, equality decisions sometimes are not made when these loans are structured. Uh, to that extent, uh, that there's a justification. Even within the global uh, public finance uh, regime, there are options uh, for relief, even from commercial lending, where uh, a borrower is not able to meet up with his obligation. Sometimes you ask for repackaging some kinds of reform. So the relief uh, and the debt forgiveness that is being canvassed is a work on development. It has happened in the past. We need to go back to the books, look at the mechanisms uh, that brought about those loans, and we can rework those loans and find a way to get a relief. And beyond the debt uh, forgiveness, there's another leg of this uh, clamor uh, in terms of uh, to what extent can we finance uh, climate change, particularly in terms of climate adaptation, resilience, and co-financing, particularly to the global south. So if you look an overview, take an overview of uh, some of these reforms that are being engineered by celebrities and some political leaders, I think is a work on development. And I think if you look at the book, Closely, uh, there's a need uh, for debt forgiveness. Forget what Abbasanjo and Kenja Iwala did in the past. It's a constant mechanism to see how we can clean up uh, that space in terms of, even if you read some of those books, um, there's a particular one uh, uh, that addresses these issues, that talks about the roles of these institutions. Those who have served in this institution says that some of those policies do not work for the global South. In that regard, therefore, 
yes, this clamor uh, is welcome, uh, and I think I, I support uh, that clamor uh, for forgiveness. On the other hand, leaders must equally be responsible in terms of how they deploy uh, the people resources for development. Okay, I, I would like to go through this open letter written to G20 and uh, make some statement here. It said, 80 years on, we need another Bretton Woods moment, referring to the establishment of IMF and World Bank. Now, here's the issue. The institutions of world finance have lost their muscle. Now, do you agree with that statement? Then let's look at the need for another Britain Woods you know, moment. If that is going to happen, is that actually the solution? Or for these nations that are missing out in the global equations to own up and have sense of responsibility, will the Britain moment change anything? Or even looking at the role of IMF in the last 80 years and World Bank? I think in my view, if I understand that statement correctly, uh, 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 it was a metaphor. Uh, used by uh, those celebrities uh, to capture the moment. They are saying what led uh, to uh, the establishment of uh, the World Bank uh, Group and the United Nations institutions uh, that support uh, the global architecture, that some of these institutions, as it were, are that live uh, uh, the founding fathers uh, philosophy of trying to recalibrate a global system after the war-torn uh, devastation that occasioned by the Second World War. And the Marshall Plan was rolled out for development. Those Marshall Plan that were rolled out in the early uh, 50s up to now, to what extent have those uh, institutions imparted the global financial statement? So, what it means is that we should retool those institutions in line with current realities, in line with the geopolitical alignment that has taken place in the last 80 years. And you can see uh, the semblance of um, economic union or custom unions, the BRICS and some other institutions. Uh, they are trying to recalibrate that kind of architecture that uh, suits uh, the development uh, agenda of some, some of those institutions that has come together. So the call here is that, yes, because we are tied to the United Nations system, but then, in particular, the Bretton Woods institution, are they really very useful, particularly to the global south? So the call is that, let's tweak those institutions in line with the founding philosophy, which, over time, has been eroded based on politics, based on the alignment, based on the G20, based on the big five, big six, whatever big you can think about. So we need that um, reform. We need that restructuring in line with the current reality. So I support that uh, kind of call for action. What kind of practices will the restructuring of the Brentsy Wood institutions alter? globally, particularly for developing countries that look up to them for direction, look up to them for guidance and even for funds, will it alter some of those things that the developing countries have been used to over the years? It will certainly. Um, uh, the clamor now is that uh, the dollarization of the global financial system uh, has been inimical uh, to growth and development, particularly in the global south. Therefore, if you reform some of these institutions, uh, the over-reliance on the, the politics of the broader winter institution uh, will be broken entirely. Though we might have new political alignment, new uh, problem with the institutions, but by and large, there's a need to reform so that some uh, countries can break away from the stronghold of uh, America in particular and the other uh, six giants uh, that dominate uh, the world international, uh, the global international system. This issue of climate financing, how can it be addressed so that access to finance needed for this kind of development can be achieved globally? Yeah, for me, uh, I've always come uh, for the fact that there's a need uh, for energy transitioning uh, to green energy or renewable energy, whatever name is called. 
but those who are providing the pathway uh, for transitioning uh, the greatest polluters uh, of this world. Uh, they've made promises uh, from the various climate change uh, conferences, even up to the recent one that was just ended in December uh, in uh, Dubai. Uh, some of these um, uh, political or diplomatic promises that are made at uh, some of these summits have not come true. Therefore, why there's a need uh, to position uh, to new technology in terms of uh, energy, there's a need uh, for the Global South in particular to continually invest on some of the traditional energy uh, 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 program because uh, the West uh, that is encouraging us to transit to renewable energy are massively investing in those sectors. For example, Russia, Germany and China are making massive investment, even India, on the coal uh, to power uh, energy. Whereas, they are encouraging us uh, to transit. And when we transit, uh, the benefit, the first benefits, uh, we go back to them. And you, just a week ago, we talked about the investment uh, that was brokered by uh, uh, the UK government in terms of renewable energy in South Africa. It's going to cost about 150 million dollars. So the global south uh, must be wary uh, in some of those promises uh, that they have made uh, to the global south in terms of climate change financing. We need about 5.4 billion US dollar year on year to be able to get to that uh, milestone of 2030. But when you look at some of those promissory notes made during uh, summit diplomacy, uh, the answers in terms of financings are not there. So to balance that development equation, in my view, is that why there's a need if we have the financing locally uh, to provide renewable energy, we can invest. But then we must to pursue the traditional means of uh, providing energy uh, for the citizens. And the challenge here is that um, these institutions will always make promises to us as if they are financing us. And at the end of the day, they actually bring in uh, their finished products for us to buy here. So we must be wary of those financing. So if we can have some financing for renewable energy uh, within the African Development uh, Bank, we can do that. Therefore, we may not wait uh, for some of those uh, financing that is uh, promised uh, from the global north. Incidentally, uh, they are the greatest uh, polluter. Why they are encouraging us to make investment in new technologies to drive renewable energies. They are making massive investment in the traditional means of uh, energy for their people. So we must understand this politics. And African leaders, in particular, must look at uh, the international conspiracy uh, that has always been the center stage of international diplomacy and uh, politics. Talking about polluters, in our earlier conversation with uh, the guest that we had in that segment, Wali Obanyoju, who is uh, a climate advocate, now he um, uh, made mention of the climate debt and how most of the monies that's supposed to come to Africa for the activities of the world nations that have increased uh, uh, climate change in Africa have not yet come. Now, what should be the responsibility of the um, host nations of some of these companies towards recalling or getting this debt to be paid for instance, uh, if you go to some parts of Nigeria where oil is explored, you will see very well the activities of some of these companies and how much they've polluted the environment. What should they begin to do to ensure cleanup, to ensure that funds are released for climate mitigation and, of course, adaptation? Yeah, I think for me, uh, what is crucial, uh, particularly in Nigeria, the example you just gave earlier, 
I think where you have uh, licenses uh, uh, to be released to the exploration companies, uh, uh, climate change uh, mitigation adaptations must be spelled out uh, when they are doing the environmental impact assessment, uh, what they need to do to the host community upfront. And the agencies of government must find a way to realize uh, those action plan that has been uh, put in place uh, to sustain uh, the environment, particularly areas of exploitation and exploration. Two, when you're talking about social responsibility, uh, the action points uh, from most of those companies must be seen in a way that they behave responsibly, not giving money to government officials, whereas some of the sustainability plan some of those companies have for those environment must be seen uh, to be put in place and regulatory framework that support that. Once there's an infraction into some of those policy framework, then the ministries and agencies of government must do the needful to revoke their licenses and that will bring them to high level of operational efficiency and sustaining the environment where they operate. All right. Now let's look at the issue of debt crisis. Um, I'm aware, you know, the advocacy for debt relief and all that. You know, a great example of the one uh, Blessing made reference to, the one Nigeria had during the ambassador era. But let's talk about these over-dependence on IMF and World Bank by most of these African countries. Rather than seeking debt relief, don't you think it's important to look inward and also address the issue of cost of co governance and also the issue of revenue shortfall in most of these countries? rather than going to World Bank or IMF to seek for relief or support? Uh, thank you very much, yes. Uh, the second question, I will come to that uh, later. Uh, the call by the celebrity uh, is in line with the question you just asked. This global architecture uh, that has been there for over 80 years has not really sustained the global south in particular. So first, is to re-engineer the process in terms of changes that must be made in terms of the way we transact business in the global space. Number two, African leaders uh, must remove these blood lessons of colonial uh, heritage uh, in terms of uh, the classification after the partition of Africa in uh, 1885 uh, or thereabout where most colonial infrastructure still dictates the way uh, governance is run in Africa. So number one, restructuring the global architecture after 80 years to retune uh, the financial system. Two, leaders must win themselves out of this colonial mentality of always thinking that what comes from uh, Washington, London, Beijing, uh, profound solution to some of our challenges. Then two, finally, in line with your governance issue, we must look in what? We must find a way uh, for now to see the World Bank, IMF, and the sister companies of within the uh, Bretton Woods Financial Institution uh, should be a, a last resort in terms in, in terms of our development planning and development agenda. If we're able to play along those lines, uh, our reliance on those institutions will reduce over time. And finally, on the template of governance, corruption has been a bane in African development effort. Therefore, leaders must find a way to account for every naira and kobo for every pan, every sterling that they get to work for the people. Once some of this money really work for the people, then the issue of debt, first and foremost, will be a thing of the past. But then the global disorder uh, must be done in a way that it can favor Africa. And some of the continental institutions uh, that are working in line with some of these Bretton Woods institutions must equally find a way uh, to rework their framework that are based on financial architecture 
of the global south, particularly in Africa and in Nigeria in particular. So these stars are trying to leverage star power to actually put pressure on the institutions for policy change. Do you think at the end of the day, much of that star power can influence policy changes given the interest and for how long that this interest have had sway? Yes, uh, it may look difficult at the beginning, but uh, one of the major uh, things you must do in the public space or public arena is to constantly find a way to change a policy framework. Uh, the civil society organization, which are part of the people that are combined with uh, those celebrities, we continue to pursue the agenda. And I do know for sure that um, in this uh, spring meeting, before the annual meeting that will come up in October, uh, there's an ecosystem uh, that supports civil society. And those voices uh, will be aggregated, and they will find a way uh, to get into those uh, rooms where decision makers, particularly central bankers, ministers of finance, and other big global uh, civil society organizations be able to lend their voices to some of this call. And even within uh, the UN system, there have been some reform, but those reforms are not far reaching until we get to the financial architecture, which is more do uh, dominant in terms of uh, changing the political conf geopolitical configuration across the world. Now, let's talk about uh, the spring meetings of the IMF, World Bank, and other you know, agencies that are taking place. Now, our obligation on this program is to shape policy and advance development. So if I may put that to you, what kind of conversation, what kind of crucial decisions should be taken at this meeting? Perhaps your conversation, this conversation should will also help to shape the policy and developmental issues that arise from these meetings. What kind of crucial decisions should be taken at this meeting to address these issues that we've raised or these celebrities have raised and also to address the issue of the inequality in the global ecosystem? Uh, one, uh, one of the challenges that uh, when policymakers, Minister of Finance, uh, they meet in Washington, uh, they have a, a clear picture of how the global financial system uh, should run. But if you look at the international bureaucracy, uh, particularly from the Bretton Woods institutions themselves, they become uh, uh, um, a kind of uh, wheel uh, that is clogging uh, development. Uh, there's one uh, particular uh, sideline event uh, that I, I saw that is very important, uh, that is targeting Africa uh, for the next generation in terms of climate change, climate ad adaptation. So they should be able to bring that out of the room and see how we can put those things to action, uh, particularly with the Minister of Environment, uh, the development partners from Africa, the development institutions in Africa can take on uh, uh, the final point or the final outcome of those uh, meetings. Sometimes there's a disconnect uh, between the summit and what comes into the field in terms of execution. But you have the room full with central bankers uh, across the world. Let's see how that they, they can bring that into uh, the policy framework in terms of monetary framework, in terms of uh, uh, physical uh, framework. And today, uh, if you permit me to speak to that, there's something they call physical monitor uh, that will be launched uh, about now which uh, talked about physical responsibility, how the media space uh, can key into this ecosystem uh, to support uh, climate change, adaptation, resilience, and financing. So if the civil society uh, group, uh, who are the voice or the voiceless, are able to push this agenda and begin to see how uh, the media advocacy, civil society advocacy, and the influencing activities can help uh, to push those policy. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we might see some light at the end of the tunnel.
Mm. If you call your father out in public, there's likely going to be some, <laughs> some consequence of this, which this seem like, because the brain Road institutions over the years have been like uh, the father of financial institutions globally, and especially uh, developing countries. Now, do you see potential uh, fallback from uh, this advocacy that the celebrities are channeling? Now, if some policies are changing or would change, with there be potential fallbacks on this on developing countries? I'm going to cite just one that comes to mind, and I'm looking at. I don't. Uh, I don't want to say anything about that. But uh, when some African countries or some developing countries go asking for assistance, uh, how do you see that playing out later on? I, I don't see uh, any problem with that uh, because these institutions, um, in the last 30 years or so, there have been kind of institutional reforms even within the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, I can speak for sure that the World Bank group have a civil society and advocacy group that aggregates public interest in terms of um, public financing, in terms of policy framework. On the other hand, the IMF in itself has a civil society and policy advocacy group within those institutions. Therefore, if they have a desk, even within the African Development Bank, they have an ecosystem that supports this call to action. And I'm sure that this call to action are sometimes aggregated and uh, they look at them when uh, formulating uh, policy. But the extent to which those framework impact on the larger society remain to be seen. But uh, what is saying advocacy and influencing keep speaking, keep raising the voice, keep the advocacy going. At a point, uh, we come to a minimum threshold where some of these uh, policy formulators uh, will have no other option than to change those policy regime. And people that have served in those institutions have equally come out of those institutions and are equally involved in those advocacy that, yes, we work in these institutions. These institutions are not the best place they equally need reform. I'm sure where that advocacy is sustained over a period of time will come to that route where decision makers, policy makers uh, will work in the interest of uh, the global citizens. And those people who worked with the institutions had to say that when they are left, truly, you don't talk while you're eating, table manners. Mm. I know sometimes some have even resigned based on a uh, policy framework that are not in support of even the original philosophy uh, that led to the formation. Uh, there are a lot of names, uh, we won't want to call names uh, here. Very, uh, a Nobel laureate uh, who served with uh, uh, Bill Clinton actually walked away from the IMF based on some of those uh, policy uh, framework issues that were not in tandem with the original philosophy of those institutions. So, not necessarily where they live. Some take a bow quietly and live when those institutional frameworks are not in line with the original philosophy of those institutions. All right. So let's wrap up with the concluding part of the open letter. And I would like to take the concluding statement. It's, the, it's like a call to action, you know, <coughs> to IMF and what by says, triple the investment and crippling debt, make polluters pay. That's the concluding part of the open letter. I would like you to react to the Astro wrap up. Make polluters pay. How will that play out? Well, there's um, a strategic framework uh, for United Nations uh, uh, Department of Environment uh, that are responsible for climate change uh, issues. Some of these global leader, like the G20 uh, that this letter has been written to, had made commitments from Glasgow to Kenya to, um, what is the last one? Dubai. Dubai. Those commitments have been made. But then, in terms of actual financing, releasing all this uh, money, uh, decarbonization of the ecosystems that they are committed to, those monies are not there. Therefore, this call is that if you have polluted the environment, based on your production activities, then you must pay. On the other hand, 
some of this loan framework that you design uh, to take the people out of poverty for sustainable development, this has not taken place. Therefore, there is some form of debt relief so that some of these people can break. And your sustainable development goal, if you look at goal number one to goal seven, which are the most critical, nothing has happened in the last uh, five to seven years. Therefore, this call is a wake-up call to action, reminding leaders, particularly leaders of the Global North, to renew their commitment, particularly in terms of climate change adaptation, mitigation, resilience, and co-financing to address those critical issues. Therefore, leaders must wake up to their responsibility, uh, not just talking, they must walk the talk in line because this environment belongs to every one of us. And the more we endanger the environment, the more we endanger a livelihood, the more we endanger uh, the space uh, in which we operate. In terms of uh, diseases uh, that are occasioned by depletion uh, on the environment. Therefore, a collective action uh, must be taken to address uh, this issue in respect of the Global South in particular. Mm. Okay, thank you so much, Sam Oroji, for being on the show today and sharing wonderful insights on the topic for discuss. My pleasure. Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development.